Are we on here? Welcome to this uh, follow-up panel discussion of Joyce Carol Oates' Avenali lecture uh, of last evening. The title of the lecture, you may remember, is The Writer's Secret Life, Rejection, Woundedness, Inspiration. We had no idea it was all so funny. <laughs> um, I'm very happy to, to um, introduce the panelists who will be offering some comments in response to the talk, um, following which we'll ask Joyce if she w wishes to respond back, and then uh, we'll turn things over to, uh, to your questions and, com and comments. At that point, we'll have two microphones uh, available, and I would like to ask you to please wait until, if you have a question, please wait until the microphone reaches you to speak, because we are making an audio and, and a video capture of this, and without the microphone, the questions just go on completely unheard. Um, the panelists in, and the order in which they will uh, respond are uh, Dorothy Hale, professor of English uh, here at, uh, at Berkeley, the author of Social Formalism, the novel in theory from Henry James to the present, and also the editor of the monumental anthology, the novel and anthology of criticism and theory, uh, 1900 to 2000, that was published by Blackwell in 2006, and currently working on a project uh, relating the novel and ethics. Uh, I believe the working title is Novelistic Aesthetics and the New Ethics. Uh, then novelist Vikram Chandra, senior lecture, lecturer in English and author of many very well-received uh, uh, novels, including Sacred Games, Love and Longing in Bombay, and Red Earth and Pouring Rain. Writer, editor, and founder of the Three Penny Review, Wendy Lesser is the author of some nine books, including His Other Half, Men Looking at Women Through Art, Pictures at an Execution, my favorite, one of my favorite titles, uh, a novel, The Pagoda in the Garden, and very, very soon to be released, Music for Silenced Voices, Shostakovich and his 15 quartets. So uh, I'd like to welcome the, the panelists, thank them for being here, and invite Dori Hale to start yeah. things off. Um, I, I, um I was just told that I had um, permission to refer to Ms. Oates as Joyce. I think I'll continue to refer as Ms. Oates as I've written it for reasons I think will become apparent, I hope, as uh, I, I discuss uh, my response to the talk last night. It's an issue of address and intimacy. Um, I want to say, first of all, how much I enjoyed the talk last night and to confess that the key terms in the title of the lecture, Rejection and Woundedness, had not led me to anticipate that I would laugh so much. And as I was laughing at the wit of Ms. Oates' presentation, I was also sure that I was not the only member of the audience who wondered how Ms. Oates' delightful public analysis of the willed outsiderness of other writers as misfit, invalid, rebel, reject, solitary, could connect to her private experiences of rejection and woundedness that might have enabled her own spectacular artistic success. Perhaps we might hear more today about the rebellion that was necessary in her own life to free herself, as Emily Dickinson and Virginia Woolf did, from oppressive familial and social inspection. Or perhaps that will remain a secret, one that we will only intuit indirectly from the public statements that the writer is willing to make about other authors and the novels she herself has written. It is this structure that a writer's secret life exists because it remains hidden, even when it seems to be confessed, that I want to dwell on today. Because it seems to me that this notion may describe not just how one comes to pursue the art of writing, but also how the art of the novel has come to be understood through the 20th century and into our own moment. In Ms. Oates's lecture yesterday, she mentioned Henry James as a source for the idea that the great artist expresses his truest self through the work of art he creates. James, of course, is as famous for his views about novelistic aesthetics as he is for the novels he wrote. His literary critical project was to articulate the basis upon which a genre hitherto valued, when valued at all, for its ethical power 
improving or corrupting might be regarded as a work of high artistic achievement and worthy authorial endeavor. James is famous for describing the novel in terms of its compositional features, which by the 1920s would come to be called by writers and critics alike the form of the novel or the craft of fiction. But it is intensely interesting to me that James himself refused to dictate formal imperatives for good fiction, even though he was obsessed with thinking about the novel as composition. He instead insisted that it was the author's ability to express his vision of life, what he also calls the author's individual point of view, in his work that is the only absolute for judging the novel as an artistic achievement. We might be tempted to dismiss the value James places on sincere and authentic, authentic self-expression as a symptom of his liminal position, one foot in the 19th century and the other in the 20th. The idea that the artwork is a privileged mirror of authorial identity seems a holdover from romanticism and perhaps even more specifically from romantic poetry. Many of James's modernist inheritors, especially those inspired to theorize the novel as a distinctive literary form, simply detached James's expressive philosophy from his remarks about composition, so that James is frequently credited, erroneously, for rules governing the craft of fiction that he pointedly refused to make. What James expresses in his prefaces as tastes and preferences have become creative writing workshop maxims. Show, don't tell, eliminate exposition, carefully manage point of view, economize, and of course, dramatize, dramatize. But in my study of 20th and 21st century Anglo-American novelists, I have discovered that many novelists never stopped talking about their writing as first and foremost an expression of a vision of life, a worldview, a set of beliefs, an authentic self, whatever seems most real to them about their identity and being. Zadie Smith might have been among the examples Ms. Oates provided last night of the young superstar novelist who still labors under the burden of her first novel novel's blockbuster success. A recent essay Smith wrote for The Guardian is called Fail Better. The fall from public grace is clearly on Zadie Smith's mind. Smith's own measure of artistic failure or success is, as it also is for James, a matter of achieved self-expression rather than accomplished form. In Fail Better, Smith voices the belief that, quote, writing is the craft that defies craftsmanship. Craftsmanship alone will not make the novel great, unquote. Smith echoes James when she declares the only absolute measure of an artist's success to be the expression in the work of art of the writer's point of view, what she calls the author's way of being in the world. Great writing, Smith believes, quote, forces you to submit to its vision, unquote. In her example, quote, you spend the morning reading Chekhov and in the afternoon walking through your neighborhood, the world has turned Chekhovian. The waitress in the cafe offers a non sequitur a dog dances in the street. Ms. Oates' lecture last night analyzed the way that social, personal, and professional failure could be recouped as artistic liberation and inspiration. Smith alerts us to what we might call the continuing narrative of artistic failure. If turning away from the world is a necessary condition for inspired artistic production, what guarantees that the world one creates will successfully express the secret self. Smith calls her essay fail better because she believes the writer must not only fail her public and publisher, but also fail in her art. Art gives the writer the opportunity to convey what is most real about her experience. But Smith asks, how can anyone, quote, convey all the truth of all of our experience, unquote. Smith thus believes that artistic achievement is itself measurable by a standard of failure. The best artists are the ones most able to gauge privately, in secret, what she calls the intimate side of literary failure, as contrasted to the bad review. 
the degree to which each new artwork falls short of the full expression of the author's way of being in the world. Smith's notion of artistic success as linked to expressional failure opens up an important related question in the consideration of novelistic aesthetics as it emerged through James and into the 20th century. Where in the novel is this secret self, however attenuated, located? How is a writer's vision of life expressed through the project of writing a novel? In the novel as a genre, the author's vision of life is problematized not just by its contrastive relation to mere craft, as if form could be separated from self-expression, but also from the realist novel's other great generic task, the depiction of characters of other people with other ways of being in the world, with other points of view. Is the novelist expressing his secret self if he is busy representing the true selves and very often private consciousness and hidden secrets of his own characters? The interesting structure of novelistic aesthetics is that the novelist expresses his secret self as a social project. In turning away from the public world, he turns toward the social others he creates as characters. In expressing his secret life, he creates the secret lives of other people not himself. And if we say that the wounded author simply reproduces himself through the wounded characters who mirror him, we have not answered the question of why he needs to write his woundedness as character, as fiction rather than memoir or biography. Autobiography. The expression of the author's secret life through fiction has developed in the 20th century not so much as substance, but as evanescence. Virginia Woolf may have been freed as a writer by the death of her father, and the removal thereby of his patriarchal pressure. But when we turn to Wolf's fiction, where do we find the hidden self that could at last be expressed? Where does that vision of life reside? In her essay, Women in Fiction, Wolf famously criticizes Charlotte Bronte and George Eliot for expressing, quote, not merely the writer's character, but the, quote, presence of a woman, unquote. This position I find hard to reconcile with Wolf's feminism except by understanding that in her mind, the art of the novel demanded a capacity for alterity, for otherness, that is not just a matter of artistic craft, but to Wolf's mind, of personal character. The presence of a woman is detected by Wolf in Eliot's and Bronte's, quote, desire to plead a personal cause or to make characters the mouthpiece of some personal discontent or grievance, unquote. But if one's vision of life includes resentment of her sex and a desire to plead for its rights, why shouldn't such emotions and views be clearly expressed? The answer to this question lies in Wolf's equal allegiance to the novelistic value of characterological autonomy, and even more the projected independence of the novelist's created social world, as well as the, what she calls the perfect integrity of the work of art which the artist has made come alive precisely through the invisibility that she has achieved in her self-expression. To the degree that the not reader's attention is drawn to the author, to attributing opinions and emotions to Bronte or Eliot rather than to Jane or Dorothea, the illusion of characterological freedom is broken. Characters are no longer living, but seem mouthpieces for the author. The novel itself ceases to be a living thing. But what Ms. Oates's lecture allows us to see as well is that to label opinions or emotions of, in a novel as belonging to the author is also for the author's secret life to lose its secretiveness. The only way a novel can seem living is through its elusive relation to the author. The secret life not quite revealed, the personal causes not quite expressed, the opinions difficult to locate, those promises of intimacy animate the novel so it too can seem to live as art. In her powerful novel, We Were the Mulvaney's, Miss Oates attributes to Patrick Mulvaney a view about beauty that resonates, I think, with the argument I'm trying to make about novelistic aesthetics. The quote is, of course he knew beauty didn't exist. He hadn't known then, but he knew now. Beauty is a matter of perspective, subjectivity, cultural prejudice. You require a human eye, a human brain, a human vocabulary. In nature, there is nothing. Patrick then adds, still beauty gives comfort, 
who knows why. Is this the belief offered to vivify the secret life of Patrick Mulvaney, aspiring scientist, PhD student at Cornell? Is it offered through Patrick as Joyce Carol Oates' view of beauty? These questions about the novel's perspectivalism and the perspectivalism of beauty itself seem to me to get at the heart of the complicated aesthetics that have developed around the novel. The novel asks us at every moment, what, to what human does this eye belong? Which human brain? Which human, what human vocabulary? Author, narrator, character, woman, man, gay, straight, American, South African, European, educated, uneducated, rich, poor, middle class. The inherent perspectivalism of the modern novel is a testament to the impossibility of any objective standard of aesthetic beauty and would seem to outlaw beauty wholly as a standard of artistic evaluation and judging any artwork, let alone the novel itself. The novel as a genre teaches us to ask, beautiful, to whom? William Faulkner describes in an early introduction to The Sound and the Fury the day that he, quote, shut a door between himself and the publisher's addresses and book lists. With this act of rebellion, he became the psychic outlaw Miss Oates described last night. He was free to write a book for himself, a work of art that would match his true vision of life, however alienated this might be from public norms. This rebellion does indeed bring inspiration to Faulkner, and what interests me in his retrospective description of that transformational moment is how the freedom for self-expression generates as an artistic goal not the creation of an artwork that is the perfect mirror of his hidden self, but an artwork that out of his hidden self will seem to bring forth new autonomies that exist apart from himself. Quote, this is Faulkner. I said to myself, now I can write. Now I can make myself a vase like that which the old Roman kept at his bedside and wore the rim slowly away with kissing it. So I, who never had a sister and was fated to lose my daughter in infancy, set out to make myself a beautiful, tragic little girl. The novelist's act of turning away from the social world unleashes <clears throat> a hidden self that seeks to create works of art in which the hidden self remains, so, hit, remains hidden enough so that it can seem wholly other to its author. The novel is a genre as a genre provides the beauty of alterity as a comfort to the necessary aloneness and subjectivism described by Ms. Oates in the passage I've quoted from the Mulvaney's. Through its fictive otherness, through its projected alterities. And the degree to which the novel as a mimetic and characterological form puts limits on authorial self-expression is also the degree to which the novel can seem to possess not just formal integrity, a vase rather than a text, but life itself. In what Ms. Oates last night called the beautiful quote from Ernest Hemingway, the artist bent upon authentic self-expression thus does not offer through the novel a vessel that brims with a knowable substance of the author's revealed true self, but a fictional world that brims with a promise of intimate self-revelation, which it always fails to deliver. Thank you. Thank you very much for those remarkably thoughtful uh, comments. I realize that that will be quite a challenge to bear all this in mind uh, uh, as we proceed through the other, uh, the, the other comments and remarks. But I think in the interest of, of, of time uh, and for us to get a sense of the, the collective uh, res responses to the talk, we'll proceed um, as planned with the, uh, with the other uh, panelists. So Vikram? Mm, yes. I just have a written question for Dory. Just checking, fact checking. Um, if I could read it. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> Did so, so, well, women Sam, have no character? Samuel Johnson. Was that was that was in the Grouchy Mood, right? Uh, I'm not sure. Not sure. <laughs> Somebody in this room full of scholars. <laughs> That's why I wrote Said my thing about uh, a woman standing on her, no a dog standing on his hind legs would be like no, a woman anyway, creature. I, it's, yeah. <laughs> Sorry. Yeah. Right. Uh, is that the Samuel Johnson no, quote you're looking for? No, 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 no. Okay, all right, maybe this is, this is what happens when you try and improvise on the morning off on the bus. <laughs> um, okay, so as, as I listen raptly to Joyce, I'm gonna call you Joyce, tell these stories about writers and their isolation, 
um, and their wounds, um, I listened with sympathy and sometimes unwilling recognition. Listening to these narratives together, though, I think brought to my attention a pattern, a kind of rhyming among them. That is, each, of, each one of these stories was deeply and profoundly rooted in personal history. The writer's isolation, his or her sorrow can, and, and rage can be traced back to family drama and the widespread but personally experienced oppressions of class or gender or race. And yet, in the moments when we hear these writers talking about what it is that they do within their pro process, how writing happens when it's happening well, we hear phrases like mystical trance. When Samuel Beckett says, it all came together between the hand and the page, there is a curious removal of self, of that suffering, raging I. It's as if in the moment of making, there was somebody or something else doing the making. Um, and, and I've been thinking about this a lot, but I've been <laughs> hesitant to talk about this, except that towards the end of your um, talk, you talked about how we move into the territory of the spiritual and the unchartable, which is what is giving me, um, it's prompting me to go on in this direction. So I've been reading recently, or attempting to read, pre-modern Indian literary criticism. This is a literary and critical tradition that we can trace back in a historiographical kind of way with actual texts and so forth for about 2,000 years. What might be called the Sanskrit cosmopolis existed through the first millennium, and its heyday stretched from the borders of Afghanistan across the subcontinent and down south to Thailand and Indonesia. Starting in the 11th and 12th centuries, there was a blooming of regional literatures in languages like Kannad and Tamil. This vernacular revolution was a reaction to and against Sanskrit cosmopolitanism, even as each of those literatures became, if you will, a kind of regional cosmopolitanism. What is striking about these writers and critics to me is that at their best, they are sophisticated and nuanced, interested in the subtleties of emotion and experience, and that they draw upon an incredibly varied body of traditions in linguistics, psychology, and metaphysics. Um, in fact, they're so damn refined that sometimes just thinking about reading their work makes my head hurt. <laughs> and yet, they seem curiously uninterested in personal histories. Modern scholars and historians often complain about this indifference to the details of individual lives, and especially the lack of care about specific places and times. And there have been all kinds of explanations constructed to, to account for this, one of them being that Indians are generally fuzzy about time in general. It just goes in cycles. <laughs> um, so these writers remain, in a sense, hidden from us. They're absent. They're only present to us through their work. And the reason I was thinking about Samuel Johnson, in a sense, is if I'm remembering right, somebody said, and I think it was Sam Johnson in a particularly grouchy mood, that it's impossible to write a novel about a woman because women have no character, right? In other words, they lack interiority, that they're, they're impossible, you, you cannot do it, it's a contradiction in terms. So, and I think that, that sort of, um, that, that perception that, that pre-modern people and often people who are other than us, right? So in, other in terms of gender or cultural location, lack interiority. And particularly when they act like these, these critics and writers um, in that they construct this entire literary world which doesn't seem to care about personality at all, um, or only in kind of um, very gestural, mythic ways. So the usual way to think about this perceived lack is to argue that, well, these old-timey folks lived in a kind of collective haze where individuality didn't really exist. And they just didn't know enough and weren't self-aware enough to be, quote, um, true individuals, and I'm quoting a particular Indian critic, um, like us. So they weren't true individuals like us until a bunch of writers and thinkers in Europe made the modern novel happen in about the 18th century. And after that, it became clear to all of us, or most of us, that full consciousness exists through the detail of mundane daily life and within a particular kind of obsessive, never-ending examination of that life. Those of us who belong to the global bourgeoisie often tend to think about contemporary people who are, un, um, who are embarrassingly unmodern in exactly this way. And I'm thinking about the newspaper reports that start with sentences like, going to place X is like stepping back into the 12th century. 
and, and then go on with things like, in this remote place, tradition rules the lives of the inhabitants, and so forth. Um, I've always felt uneasy about this kind of developmental historical narrative. And lately, as I've tried to read a bit more of pre-modern fiction and criticism, I've become embarrassed at how silly and provincial it is to think about my predecessors in this way. Um, this is especially so when I think of my own life, of my own practice as a fiction writer and my personal history. Like many of the people that Joyce spoke about, I had some trauma and unhappiness in my childhood, and which I, I'll be a bit old fashioned about that and keep it to myself. But I, I can tell you about my reaction to this unpleasantness. I experienced isolation and loneliness. I felt like an outsider, like an alien. In other words, I became that nerdy, awkward kid who needed to tell stories to write. The Bronte sisters made up fictional worlds, and so did I. I had an orange rubber ball that I would bounce as I walked in circles, and I would have stories happen inside me. I would quite literally be in a trance. I wouldn't hear my mother calling out or my sisters running about next to me. I can't quite say that I, I was telling myself stories because it wasn't quite myself that was telling the stories. It was something else, some other thing or urge or force that was inside me and that was yet impersonal. This otherness that wanted to make stories and constructions and metaphors and entire lives. So listening to Joyce last night, and hearing all these lives juxtaposed with each other, it seemed to me that trauma and woundedness and isolation perhaps drive a certain kind of person towards this inner communion with this other thing. Um, to use a Stephen King kind of image, maybe your pain and aloneness and rage open the gate to this netherworld, force you to listen to these voices within. But it's a very delicate, um, fragile kind of opening um, it can easily get jarred shut by any number of things, early success or early failure or critical rejection or critical praise, um, or even just the crowding in of, of ordinary adult life. Um, I have a, two daughters, one who is two and a half and the other is seven months, and I think about this a lot. <laughs> um, so all of this can then, can then end up, I think, distance you if you're not careful, if, if you're not I guess you can exercise some kind of discipline to preserve that tenuous connection, but it can go away despite your hardest efforts. Um, and that's, it's terrible. Now, I'm, I'm quite aware that as I'm saying this, I'm making writers and artists sound like high priestesses or shamans communing with that which is unavailable, unavailable to mere mortals. Um, I hasten to add that this is not the case, that, that I think all of us are inhabited by these subterranean realities. Um, I'm sure that you've noticed the veritable flood of recent popular science books with titles like The Hidden Brain and Predictably Irrational and The Second Brain. These books point to recent cognitive research that indicates that our conscious selves are like a thin film of oil floating on a vast ocean of hidden brain activity and that perhaps this conscious self, this I, isn't in charge of much at all. The subtitle of The Hidden Brain is, quote, how our unconscious minds elect presidents, control markets, wage wars, and save our lives, <laughs> end quote. <laughs> and I think there's actually a kind of misstep in that subtitle. It's not unconscious as much as it is pre-conscious. Um, in fact, there's some research that shows that decisions, choices, are actually made much before the conscious mind actually becomes aware of them. Our notions of choice are actually a narrative thrown up by the various brain modules after the fact. Or in other words, it's a rather nice story that gets told to us. Um, and I think this, the, the reason why these books are popular and why I read them with such fascination and, and um, interest is partly because they're kind of terrifying in a way, because we are so beholden in the modern world to the novelistic tradition of characters making choices in the world, right? And therefore the moral education of so-and-so who goes to the big city and undercoes much, but by the end is a improved and better person, right? Mm -hmm. so, so here in this, in this scientific narrative now is calling into question all those notions of autonomy and selfhood and agency. Um, and in, in relation to this, um, when I hear people like Zadie Smith talk about that, what I would ask her is, um, which self are you talking about? 
that needs expression, I think, as you did. And also, are you sure you're in control, right? Or you can control that thing? Um, I'm not so sure. Um, I just want to end with giving you two kind of interesting provocations to think about. Um, one is um, a brief look at um, Srinivas Ramanujan, who many of you will have heard of. He was a, a late 19th century, early 20th century Indian mathematician, but an Indian mathematician of kind of fantastic and otherworldly ability and, and a very interesting history. Um, his father was a clerk in a sari shop, and, um, and, and Ramanujan basically taught himself mathematics, and he had finished advanced trigonometry books by the time he was 11 and 12. He tried to go to college, but, um, and, and this was after much begging for scholarships and so forth, but he only was interested in math, so he, had, he dropped out, and then worked as a clerk in a government office, and then started sending letters to people in Cambridge, mathematicians, saying, I know this and I also know this. And most of them returned the letters without comment. Uh, G.W. Hardy, who was a prominent mathematician at the time, wrote back to him. And through their correspondence, Ramanujan, he finally became convinced that Ramanujan was some sort of prodigy. So he brought Ramanujan to England, um, where Ramanujan um, was awarded an honorary BA, which was later turned into a PhD. But he didn't actually have a good time. Um, he, he was stubbornly and kind of embarrassingly pre-modernly Indian. He, he was a Brahmin who was vegetarian. And when people asked him, how do you know these astonishing things, right? He, he had this habit of producing proofs without showing you any of the work that had brought him to that proof. Uh, when people asked him, how do you come to this? He would say, the goddess came and gave it to me. <laughs> and the goddess he was referring to was his family deity, Namagiri. And this, this goddess thing, it's, it's interesting to read about it in the biographies because it's usually mentioned, but it's glossed over. It's, they, they skip over it really quickly. And, and it seems to me it's because it's kind of embarrassing, right? And you can't really deal with it. Hardy, in fact, um, after Ramanujan died uh, at 32, really resented accounts of Ramanujan's re religiosity. Um, he, he, he thought that they were overstated and romanticized. Um, um, and it seems to me that Hardy resisted this because in his conception of the self and rationality and logic, the goddess couldn't arrive and give you things, right? You actually had to create them. Um, so that's one. Uh, the other is this morning, as I was thinking about this, I noticed on, I'm a kind of nerd, so I have all these um, blog feeds that I follow, and one of them pointed up to this interesting uh, workshop that is coming up on February 28th, which I wish I could attend. The sponsor of this workshop is DARPA. DARPA, as in the guys who funded the defense department that funded the ARPANET, which later became the internet. The, the, the workshop is called Stories, Neuroscience, and Experimental Technologies, Analysis and Decomposition of Narratives in Security Contexts. <laughs> and the reason why this interested me so much is that I think there's the notion of the writer's autonomy and self-expression. I think also on the other end, as readers and critics, we tend to think that we are in control when we receive narratives, right? And, and in fact, I think much of the second half of the 20th century in terms of critical movements is devoted to this idea of, well, here's the story coming at us, but we can see its contradictions. We can deconstruct it. We can see its hidden agendas, right, um, and its fractures. Um, but DARPA, why, does, why is DARPA interested in storytelling? Well, they tell us. Um, I'm quoting now. Stories exert a powerful influence on human thoughts and behavior. They consolidate memory, shape emotions, cue heuristics, and biases in judgment, influence in-group, out-group distinctions, and may affect the fundamental contents of personal identity. It comes at no as no surprise that these, these influences make stories highly relevant to vexing security challenges, such as radicalization, violent social mobilization, insurgency and terrorism, and conflict prevention and resolution. Therefore, understanding the roles, un therefore, understanding the roles stories play in a security context is a matter of great import and some urgency." End quote. So I just want to leave you with this idea that that if DARPA thinks that stories can actually influence people, 
um, in, in these kind of large, massive ways, um, and in some sense overcome their autonomy, um, it might be something interesting to think about. Thanks. Thank you. Thank you. I, I encourage the panelists to be very capacious and broad-ranging in their remarks, and so I'm delighted to see that you've gone, taken us from Sanskrit cosmopolitanism to DARPA. <laughs> Wendy Lesser. Okay, so uh, I find myself to be the victim of a cruel deception, possibly perpetrated by myself, but I thought last night as the three of us sat in a row listening to Joyce's wonderfully engaging talk, it was my impression that we had agreed that we were going to give informal comments today, mainly to pave the way for your questions and comments. So you can imagine my horror when I arrive today and see type on paper in front of my two colleagues, but I will persist in giving my informal comments and I hope it will last as long as theirs did. Um, I, I was particularly struck by Joyce's comments about two of the writers that she mentioned last night, and I thought I would talk about them in a context I had been thinking about already before I went to the talk. And that, the two writers are Norman Mailer and Richard Ford, and the context is nonfiction and fiction. And the reason I thought of this is basically Joyce's own writing, which has been, of course, largely fiction, and that's what we mostly know her as. But this most recent book, this wonderful uh, widow's memoir, is nonfiction. And, um, and there's a difference between the way in which you reveal the secret self to the extent it can be revealed, it seems to me, in nonfiction and fiction. I mean, you can end up telling me that I'm wrong about this in the end. And I'm, the reason I'm applying it to Norman Mailer and Richard Ford is they're not here and can't tell me I'm wrong about it. <laughs> but, um, so Norman Mailer, although he was famous as a fiction writer, and that was his first fame, Naked and the Dead, and that, that's what he tried to be all his life and, and occasionally did well, to me was great as a nonfiction writer. And so the books of his that I really treasure are advertisements for myself, which Joyce mentioned last night, The Armies of the Night, which is a truly great book about the march on the Pentagon and about many other things as well, and um, The Executioner's Song, which he called a novel, but it was in the nonfiction novel mode of Truman Capote's In Cold Blood, so I prefer to amalgamate it to, to fiction, and various of his essays, too, that appeared over the years, and, the, and, the, and Prisoner of Sex, also, which is a nonfiction work. And the thing about all these nonfiction works, which I don't think characterized his fiction, was that they were really funny at times. Not always, because Executioner's Song is about the death penalty, and uh, Armies of the Night is about the war in Vietnam. You know, these are not funny subjects, but the, the books were quite funny often, and they were funniest when the main character and the object of the humor was Norman Mailer. He was the butt of the joke, almost always the intense butt of the joke. So it seems to me that in the comment he made when he was introducing Joyce's boxing book, where he said, it's so good I thought I had written it myself, he may have pretended on some level to the audience that he didn't know why they were laughing afterwards. But the part of Norman Mailer that was funny, that is whatever fueled his sense of humor, knew why he was funny and did it on purpose to be funny, as he repeatedly did in his books. So that, for instance, if you go to Armies of the Night, one of the most wonderful and classic scenes is the encounter between Norman Mailer, he refers to himself in the third person, in part because of the tra tradition of Henry Adams, who also refers to himself in the third person, and Mailer's picking up on that 19th century education of Henry Adams in his book. He, so Norman Mailer encounters Robert Lowell, the patrician, well-spoken, wonderful, elegant poet, who is also a, an anti-war activist in there, and Norman Mailer is the street fighter, and he's a lot shorter, and he's chunkier, and he's kind of, you know, just in generally a less uh, beautiful person. And he comes off as not a fool exactly, but Lowell's remarks carry more weight in this encounter between Mailer and Lowell than Mailers do. And that's a wonderful trick to pull off if you're Mailer as a writer. And it seems to me the same thing happens in advertisements for myself and in Prisoner of Sex. And he's not present in the Executioner song, but his stand-in, Larry Schiller is. Larry Schiller, through whom he got all the information about Gary Gilmore that enabled him to write the book. And so he uses Larry Schiller as the Norman Mailer figure in the Executioner song. And in each case, in these nonfiction works, the trick lies in not telling the full truth or in molding the presentation 
of self and truth so as to make self look uh, slightly suspect and ridiculous. And it seems to me that the element of doubt about the narrator that creeps in as, as we are being fed this information is essential to our believing in the truth of the memoir. That is, doubt needs to go hand in hand with belief there for us to think that this person is telling us an important truth. Now, and now let's go to the, oh, and I'll say one more thing about Norman Miller, which is that I knew him slightly, probably not as well as Joyce did, but I, toward the end of his life, I interviewed him a couple times on stage, and I had a few social encounters with him, and he, he was always charming and elegant when I saw him. He wasn't drunk and horrible and wife-stabbing. And, um, and one of the things he said on stage once, which ties in very much with what Dory and Vikram have said about the motivations of the writer, I asked him why none of his books talked about his own childhood, why he hadn't used that material in any way, in any of his works. And he said he viewed it as the engine, the core, the almost nuclear reactor, I'm making up the words, but this was the gist of, that he was giving, of everything that he wrote. It was the fueling thing that, that made him write, and he was afraid that if he tried to reach inside that holy of holies, that little special place that was secret from himself and ran everything in his writing, that all of his writing would disappear. So he didn't touch it at all. Okay, so that was Norman Mailer. Richard Ford is a writer I discovered much later, and I may have read his earlier short fiction and thought it was good, but I didn't, I wasn't committed to it or addicted to it in any way until I discovered the f sports writer many years after it had come out. By the time I discovered the sports writer, its two sequels, Independence Day and The Lay of the Land, had already come out. And since they were written at 10 year intervals, you can imagine. So we're saying 20 years after this book comes out, I read it. I was completely smitten. I mean, I just thought this was one of the great works of American literature of the 20th century, and nobody had been talking about it to any near the degree they had been talking about the other big American writers. And then I read Independence Day and Lay of the Land and thought that as a portrait of America over these 20 years that are spanned by the three books, it was astonishing and you know, rivaled or exceeded Roth's American trilogy or any of the other big sequential works that are described as being great American works of the late 20th century. So first I thought this to myself, and then I wrote a little something on this to this effect in the Three Penny Review. And, and my analysis of what was great about these three books hinged on their uh, portrayal of the world, but also their portrayal of their main character, Frank Bascom. Frank Bascom is a very ornery fellow. He's hilarious in a way that Norman Mailer is hilarious, but he, he hates a lot of different people. He hates a lot of kinds of women. He hates ethnic groups. He hates his own children. He hates his ex-wife. He hates real estate, which is his later profession. <coughs> he hates New Jersey, which is where he lives. So there's a lot of amusing hatred emerging from Frank Bascom, but it seemed to me that there was a very interesting perspective on Frank Bascom taken by the novels, but never given to us in the way that it's given in nonfiction in the Norman Mailer books, you had to kind of see around Frank Bascom yourself. You had to kind of think, well, he is a twisted kind of guy. We're not supposed to be 100% behind him. We, you know, we think he's funny, but we don't completely identify with him. Okay, so that's the gist of what I write about these three books. And then, since it was published in the Three Penny Review, I sent that issue to Richard Ford. And he writes back a very polite letter saying, you know, he's glad I like the book so much, et cetera, et cetera. His view of Frank Baskin, Frank Baskin and mine differ somewhat. He thinks we're supposed to identify with Frank Baskin. So I thought that was amusing. And, you know, my fallback in all such cases is the D.H. Lawrence line from classic, Studies in Classic American Literature, trust the tale, not the teller. In other words, you don't interview Shakespeare to find out how you should respond to Cleopatra or... Um, Othello or Shylock, uh, he would just say, oh, it's a really meaty part or something. Nothing useful to you. Th this is all, the, the response to the work of the literature is included in the centuries that follow it and is different for everybody and there's no single thing. And so the author is not the final person that tells you what the work of literature is, but it's interesting and useful to hear what the author says if the author is alive. And it seemed to me that in some way the not knowing the not knowing why Frank Baskin was such a successful character was part of what made these three works of Richard Ford's great. I mean, his not knowing, but maybe my not knowing as well. 
But also, it seems to me that in just the same way that I talked about Norman Mailer having to hold back certain facts, Bikram talking about having to hold back some of the wounds of the childhood, in nonfiction, we don't want to hear the whole story. But in fiction, we need to hear the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth. Not in a, a courtroom way, as I've rendered but it, but in, a, in the deepest possible way. The author needs to plumb her depths and bring up stuff that would be deeply offensive to friends and family if she said it to them. Needs to go out on limbs that will crack and needs to do all sorts of things that are very, very frightening in order to get at those truths. And if we feel that the author is not doing that, if we feel that the author is cagily trying to engage the audience in a charming way, then, then that causes us to disbelieve in the fiction, in the true, deep, reflective of reality nature of the fiction, which is at the center of great novels, and I imagine great stories, great poems, any sort of great creative work. So you see the, tri the contradiction I'm trying to get at, that nonfiction shapes and withholds and uses rhetoric. Fiction uses something else that is much closer to a scalpel and that digs down and that really you know, lets blood and reveals. I'll just say a final word about rejection because in addition to being a writer, I am an editor. And, <laughs> and so I have, to, I have to receive rejection occasionally when I send out my own work. I have to practice rejection all the time. So it seems to me that the story that Joyce told last night about the cluster of Nobel Prize winners that all sent their work to the New Yorker after they got their Nobel Prizes and all got rejected, this is to the New Yorker's credit. That is, nobody, not even a Nobel Prize winner, writes good things every time they sit down to the page. And so if the New Yorker was willing to recognize this and say, you know, we loved uh, Humboldt's gift or whatever, but we don't love this particular story you've sent us, Mr. Bellow. That's pretty great on, on behalf of the New Yorker. I'm not sure I would have the courage to do that. I'm, you know, we don't get that many Nobel Prize winners sending to three pennies, so I'd be more tempted to take them. As Tom Gunn, who used to teach at this university before he died in 2004, used to say, when I asked him about this, I would say, well, I've received this submission from so-and-so, and he's a big name, but it's not such a great thing. And he said, well, publish it as news, as news of what so-and-so is doing right now. <laughs> so that was my rationale. But the, the author, the author at, at heart is a child. Uh, every author is a child. That's what enables them to do this play, this you know, making things up thing that they do. And so that child, when you send the rejection note, is wounded and resentful. But the grown-up, who is the other side of the writer, as Henry James said in The Private Life, which I assume you were, both of you, in some way alluding to, Joyce and Dory, that is a wonderful short story which you should look up if you possibly can about, it's called The Private Life, and it's about a writer who goes to a house party, like all characters in Henry James do, only this character is two characters. One sits up in the room and does the writing, and the other is down at dinner, the dinner, or out on the, you know, uh, pastures walking with other people or com commenting on the view, having chats with a politician, etc. There are two of them, the ones in the room and the others outside the room. And somebody checks this out and, and verifies it, that there are two of them. So the writer that's out there at the dinner parties, he should restrain himself from being a crying baby about the rejection. And he should say to himself, pick yourself up, pull up your socks. I'm in business, you know, let me go back and do it again. Without, of course, fully rejecting that child inside who is fueling, as Norman Mailer said, all of his work. Okay, that's it. Thank you, Wendy. Um, and thank you, thank you for helping us understand why fiction and nonfiction, in a certain sense, need each other. So I'd like to invite um, Joyce to respond to the responses. Uh, or not. I, or not, we can go right to questions, but I do see a page, a page full of notes. Um, <laughs> Marks. Well, I'm really so impressed and so thrilled by these papers. They're very different, and, and Wendy's talk was very seemingly improvised, but it's very, very beautifully composed. So, I mean, I scarcely know how to begin. Dory's paper, of course, touches many, many issues that are of a theoretical and critical nature. We could spend a whole conference on, on the ideas that are cast up in this very interesting um, presentation. But I'm really not sure how I can respond. 
<clears throat> my own my own talk last night was mm, more not really a lecture. It was more like a rumination or a series of wonderments about the strangeness and I would say the haphazard nature of the creative process and even more so the haphazard nature of success or how something's received by an audience at a certain time. So that is somewhat antithetical to the idea of there being a critical theory. I think that people are very different and maybe well, Vikram was touching upon a sort of trans personal or collective urge to, to write, which I think is also true. Now, species is compelled to do certain things. One of them is to memorialize the past, and that has given us beautiful works of art, but also religious uh, vendettas. And um, none of these things are, I think, without moral ambiguity. But we have some sort of compulsion or obligation to memorialize the past of our ancestors or our tribe, our nation, our language group, or whatever. And, it, and some people do this in, by way of art. Some people do it by way of, of history or philosophy. Some people do it by, by way of storytelling. And the so storytelling turns into these, these great works of re religious uh, anthologies. I think of the Bible not as a, as a religious work, of course, but rather an anthology of brilliant and sometimes less than brilliant, but strangely hallucinatory visions. You know, it's like a big anthology written over a period of many, many centuries. So that's the same sort of compulsion that, that we tell our stories. It's maybe the way the, why the birds sing and creatures do the things that they do. So we have this transpersonal impulse that we must, uh, we must deal with. Therefore, individuals are acting out of this impulse, but in very individual ways. So we're all very different. And someone who has, um, someone who one day picked up Walker Percy, because I'm a good friend of Richard Ford's and I know what spurred the sports writer, he started reading Walker Percy, the moviegoer. <coughs> and he was bowled over by the voice, which is a wonderful voice of Walker Percy. And that allowed him then to move away from a sort of Hemingway form. He had been very formed by Hemingway and very macho sort of writing. He was able to move away from that to this more relaxed vernacular, s rueful self-analysis and observing of the self that you get in, in Walker Percy. And then Richard read, of course, the great Ra Robert Angstrom trilogy by John Updike, which is about this very flawed but representative Robert, Robert Angstrom. So those, those influences sort of go into Richard Ford writing the books that he wrote. And Richard would be absolutely, um, you know, he, he would be very direct in, in, in attributing this. So Richard is a good example of somebody who, and Melville's another example. And Melville one day, Melville was writing these very successful tales of the South Seas that were entertaining bestsellers. He could have done that the rest of his life and made a lot of money and been sort of uh, the toast of society, let's say. One day he picked up a book by Hawthorne, uh, Mosses from an Old Manse, and he's, he read these stories, which are allegorical and puritanical and sort of pierced by a kind of Shakespearean drama and grandeur. And, and they're very different from the sort, of, the sort of casual, amusing travel writing that, that Melville was doing. So he was sort of overwhelmed by the, by the influence of Hawthorne. He had written a few pages I don't know how many pages, maybe a hundred pages or so of, of Moby Dick by that time. And this allowed him to recast Moby Dick to be a great epic novel with a lot of Shakespearean uh, passages in it. So I guess I'm stressing that we all are driven by transpersonal or unconscious forces to tell stories. And some of us do other things. Many of us are scientists or explorers where our species is just always restless and curious and we're always doing something. We're, we're not by nature a passive species and so we're always doing something. We're not like the sloths who take a long, kind of wonderful time just to do a little movement. We were a very, very restless species. So even though we have this general compulsion to tell stories, we do it in different ways and, and much of it I think is accidental. 
you know, you walk into a classroom one day and your teacher is just the perfect teacher for you. The teacher loves your work and inspires you and is very positive, gives you books to read, and you're off and running, you know. Or you have a teacher who is censorious, who is not, not supportive. You have a parent who is supportive or not supportive. All these things, I think, are, are very accidental. And I love all stories about Norman Mailer. Like Wendy, I, got, I met him late in, later in life when he wasn't so, uh, he would already become quite famous, and I think, and didn't have to deal with these, these issues. But the whole, the whole, the boxing writing of Norman Mailer, the fight, you know, that's tremendous uh, writing that Norman did as um, somewhat small, aggressive, but not, not very physical person vis-a-vis -vis Muhammad Ali, that brought out some of the very, very best writing and he's ever written about boxing and, and also Norman Mailer. So again, you have like Norman here and Muhammad Ali, this beautiful, this beautiful specimen of a heavyweight boxer. And that, the dialectic between those two is, is just so, it's so wonderful. It allows for that wonderful, wonderful writing of the fight. So many people um, might have some questions. I certainly haven't begun to cover all the, the richness of these, these presentations. Maybe people from the audience. Thank you. So let's, uh, let's indeed uh, turn to your questions. There'll be, as I said, microphones, um, one on either side. So just um, if you have a question, raise your hand and wait till the microphone reaches you. Yes, please, in the back. Thanks. Um, I was hearing last night, listening to your talk, a lot of correspondences with your recent memoir, A Widow's Story, um, particularly that this talk shows up in that memoir. So I was hearing almost like a conversation between these two nonfiction texts, the memoir and then the talk. And I think there were certain tropes that I was hearing in both, one of which was um, the bed or the nest is a place of creative retreat or recuperation. And since I know you mentioned that you've been working on this talk for quite some time now, has it changed over time? Or, or do you have any comments about the conversation between these two nonfiction pieces, the memoir you've recently published and this talk? Well, that's a, that's a very good question. I'm not even sure how to answer that. I don't really see myself with any kind of objectivity. I mean, if I see myself, it's like I'm transparent as a glass of water. I can't really see myself, and I tend to have this kind of maybe Dostoevsky or Freudian sense of the, the psychology of human beings that we, never, we are the last people to know our motives, and we no, often know what we're doing. But the more recent things I added to the paper last night, some things I didn't, have, I didn't have time to talk about. I wanted to talk about John Stuart Mill and how he had his breakdown when he was only 20 years old, which is, would be the age of many people who are undergraduates, you know, and how he restored his soul by reading Wordsworth and, and poetry, and how that seemed so exciting and so interesting. But I didn't have time to talk about that. Then the other section that I added recently was Virginia Woolf. And I was kind of struck by that because I read so much of Virginia Woolf, and we all have read Virginia Woolf, and her diaries and her letters are so, so brilliant, and so I think even more interesting than her fiction. And I didn't really have time to talk about that either. And it just seems that our lives are very haphazard. And I wonder if it isn't the case that we try to prepare ourselves, we educate ourselves, and we do a lot of reading, and then we go out into the world and it's almost like dousing for water, or we're hoping that something then will happen. I know for years and years after I wrote my book on boxing, which was sort of roundabout memoir of being my father's daughter, because my father took me to boxing matches, and everything in the book on boxing has some reference to my father having taken me to boxing matches. So I was this woman enthralled to this masculine, preoccupation from which women are excluded. The whole book was sort of about that, and it was just very, very exciting and thrilling, but also an anxiety-ridden book to write. 
and I keep adding things to it, a whole lot of chapters on Mike Tyson and, and actually chapters on Muhammad Ali. To write about Muhammad Ali after Norman Mailer was a, sort of a macho thing for me to do, I thought. And that's why it's so thrilling. And I always would go around saying, oh, I wish I had another subject for nonfiction. And years would go by. And so my husband died, and my whole life collapsed. And that would then be the subject of the next book. You know, this is so horrible and so horrific. It's like one of these terrible fairy tales where you, you wish for something, but it's on the end of your nose, or your, your son comes back and he's a corpse or something at the door. You know, these bizarre things that you wish for something, and then they happen, but not in the way that you wanted. So when I wrote, I never wrote the memoir at all, really. It was journal entries that I wrote late at night when I was really unable to sleep and extremely depressed and even suicidal. And I was in the habit, like a 19th century person, of writing in the journal. So I would just write and scraps of paper and just write what happened that day. And it was all had this very breathless air, which started when my husband was in the hospital, of being in a boat along a rapid stream without any oar and without any sense of where the boat's going and you can't even see the shore. Just each day you're sort of moving along here, so I was taking these notes. But then many, 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 many weeks later, I mean months, months a couple of years later, I took out the notes again, and then I composed what looks like a book, but it's sort of like the way, it's the way Henry David Thoreau composed Walden, which is all little parts. If you read Walden, you'll see it's all a mosaic of brilliant passages of insights and images that he put together. He didn't sit down and write the book. That's not how Walden was written. So with the memoir, it's not even a memoir. It's more like a journal. It's like prose poetry or something like that. But then it all added up together to be this portrait of a person in a breathless and terrifying position, not knowing how things will end. So it's very different from writing an autobiography like John Stuart Mill. He's 50. 47, I think, when he wrote it, and he's looking back to when he was three. You know, like that's a different way of writing where you have control of your narrative and you're, you're looking back and you're selecting out. But if you keep a journal or a diary, I think you should just write down everything, everything, every horrible, unpleasant, and many embarrassing and tedious and banal and comic things. A lot of comic and grotesque things happen to me that were really humiliating, but I put them all down, a lot of them in, in the memoir. Whereas if you're writing a more of an elegiac memoir, or something like Joan Didion's beautiful, Your Magical Thinking, I think you drop out the embarrassing or humiliating things and sort of remember the beautiful and noble and elevated things. So that's kind of a long answer to a really, really interesting question. Thank you. Yes, and this, yeah, here. Thank you very much. We all know that you've written so many books, and I'm just asking, do you really have a very strong need for writing a lot of books? And you just mentioned about your personal life, and how does your writing uh, benefit or uh, harm your personal life? Thank you very much. How does the, the writing life benefit or harm the personal life? I don't know how to answer that question. I don't think we're all very different in that regard. We all have professions, and we all have personal lives, and they sort of overlap. As I said before, in our species, we're compelled to do certain things. Some people are problem solvers. They love to solve problems. If it's just crosswood puzzles or mathematical puzzles or uh, questions of science, and some people are led to tell stories or write musical compositions. And there's great happiness in doing that, even though there's frustration day by day. And so I don't think that my experience as a writer is so different from other people's experience of all the different things that we do. It's just that I'm telling stories and somebody else is, is, is a scientific investigator, let's say, or explorer, or a politician, or, or an adventurer of different kinds. So basically, uh, that's, that's really the answer. I think we're just all very different. My personal life has often just seemed to me, again, very invisible. I don't have a sense of myself. I always thought I didn't have a personality at all. And people tell me I have a personality. <laughs> But I don't really think that I do. Um, 
I don't think that I, that I have a personality that much because I tend to feel like William James. We have as many personalities as there are people who know us. And so when I was with my parents or with a professor, or with somebody older, somebody younger, with my cat, all these different presences, I have a different personality. And, and I mean, they do overlap a bit, but I think you all find it's like Sylvia Plath writing home to her mother. You remember her letters home to her mother, it's so completely and savagely different from Sylvia Plath that we know that you have to imagine there are just two, two people there. It's not that she's schizophrenic, but William James saw the human psyche as being uh, multifaceted, so I think that's, uh, that's how I feel also. I wonder if I could um, ask a question. Um, I'm, I'm curious to know how, how you teach, um, but instead, yeah, how you teach. And, but instead of just asking you how do you teach, I wonder if I could ask you if I were thinking in this sort of perspectival dimension now, if I were one of your students, what would I say about the way you teach? <laughs> well, my, one of my students, I guess he's actually not here, but he came last night. I'm not sure, but I never talk about my own self, and I never talk about my own writing, and I just present work. And we, we may spend a whole hour going through a short story by Hemingway, for instance, so um, Indian camp. I just spend a whole hour going through there and getting a kind of collective reading of a brilliant work written by a young man in his early 20s, and then it seems like there's a sort of consensus of intellects in communication around a table of like 10 or 11 people, and the Hemingway story is, is presented. But with 10 other people at different times, maybe a slightly different story would be presented. But I don't think of myself as an int intrusive teacher. And I had such a strange experience the other evening because for some reason, I was looking up David Foster Wallace, whom, whom I did not know, but I knew his writing to some extent, and I knew people who knew him, and they were so shocked and devastated when he committed suicide. But you can access on the internet his lesson plans, his syllabus, his syllabi for his courses at the Pomona College, where he was teaching. And they're like eight densely written pages printed pages of the syllabus and what he expected from the students and what they were reading and, <laughs> and, it, and how the gr grading would be, there's so much weight for a, like an A minus or a B plus. And anyone who's a teacher in the room, you might want to just look at that because I read it and I was stunned. I was actually, I was actually stunned by that. that not, why do I find that not surprising of David Foster Wallace? <laughs> Well, to me, he's so, he seems so imaginative and, and irreverent and free, but what he created for his students was almost terrifying. I mean, they loved him as a teacher, but it's like a labyrinth, and it was like, almost like an old-fashioned school teacher who had all these strictures and all this, like week three, week four, and you do this, and five-page four, four five page paper, and this reading, and, and, and it seemed frightening to me. And I thought that maybe I would commit suicide if I had to teach that course that he had set up for himself. <laughs> and I know this sounds, it sounds a little lunatic and silly, but I almost felt that way. You know, you have to get up in the morning and you think, oh my God, I have to do all the reading and everything for that, I, that I made my students do. You think, I just can't do it, so I think it's just, so I, do, I was just shocked by that. So that's the kind of teaching I would say is exactly opposite. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. <laughs> it's the opposite of my, I want to walk in the room and be surprised. I want to surprise myself. I want the students to be writing things I didn't expect. I want them to say things about one another's work that's new. I don't want any way to have my students uh, impose any thoughts upon them at all. And I don't even grade them, and that's the nicest thing. We don't have to grade in these courses at Princeton, they're pass or fail. So there's a lot of freedom. Now to me, to be in the course with David Foster Wallace, though he's a wonderful person, I would find that like being in a straitjacket. I would have found it very, very constrictive, and also to be the teacher, I would have found it very, very unpleasant. Thank you. Question over here, yeah. Uh, as someone who's edited quite a few collections of short stories and including yours, uh, yours in the table of contents, I wonder 
um, if I were doing a new collection, which of your stories might you suggest um, be included if you uh, take into consideration that, say, the first story that um, I put in the collection was Where Have You Been? Where, where Are You Going? Where Have You Been? Uh, and I think that, of course, is an often anthologized story and a, a landmark um, you know, piece of fiction for the time, the place that, that endures. So what, what would you say, if you were thinking especially from a woman's point of view or female character, plot, whatever, what, what would you maybe put in the table of contents now? Well, thank you. This speaker is Wendy Martin. And Wendy, are you chair of the of, um, English department? Oh, wow. Vice provost. Is this Claremont College? Uh, Claremont. OK, a vice provost. This is, strikes fear in the hearts of, 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 of faculty. <laughs> Uh, well, if you start off with that, then you're going uh, with that particular story, which is about an adolescent girl that's been anthologized quite a bit and made into a movie, which was interesting in itself. Then probably a whole sequence of stories that, that kind of ricochet from that, and there are antithetical stories that, that relate to that, and stories about the same person who maybe who then is older, if it's a book for women, and many, and many, many stories that take a person like that who does something different, you know, or a story that has a, a different form to it. As I wrote that story really a long time ago, and it's one of those examples of a story that I couldn't write now because I write so much different, I write in a very different way now. I couldn't, I couldn't write that story any longer, which is sort of ironic. Now I'm really so interested in voices. I'm interested in, in idiosyncratic and unusual voices in literature and rather than my own narrative voice. But when I wrote that story, it was my narrative voice that told the story. So I probably couldn't even write that story today. Thank you. Thank yeah. you. Um, I'm struck uh, still 15 years or so later after reading the book Blonde. And I found in, in that story uh, all the horrific and the, uh, amazing um, things I might have imagined myself uh, of that particular character based on the life of Marilyn Monroe. And I'm wondered, wondering, uh, still today, fascinated by your own uh, attraction to her life, her, her story, the horrific experiences she had in Hollywood, um, and what impelled you to do the depth of research that must have entailed well, your, your question just really makes me all thrilled and, and excited because I remember I didn't have any thoughts about Marilyn Monroe or any interest in the celebrity famous actress at all, no, no interest at all. But one day, I was in the library, and for some reason, I saw this photograph of a girl. She was about 15, 16, 17 years old, and she had brown hair, and she had a little like flower hat or something. And she was very sweet looking. She was like a high school girl. And it was Norma Jean Baker. And I saw that picture. And I thought, oh, she reminds me of girls I went to, to grade school with in my country one room schoolhouse. She reminds me of my own mother. There was something wistful about her. And I just came over me suddenly like a, like a feeling of great excitement that this girl had no idea what was coming. She was just a girl. She didn't even have a, she didn't have a father. She didn't even have a mother. She, had, she was so poor. She had been in an orphanage in Los Angeles. She was in foster homes. Norma Jean Baker, at that time in her life, had no idea what was coming in just a few years. And I thought, what an, Ameri what an American fairy tale. And I thought I would go back and write about that girl and I would write about 180 pages of a postmodernist parable. It would end with her getting her magic name, and that would be Marilyn Monroe, because the name was given to her. You know, it wasn't her, cho her choice. And so the end of my little novel would be, she gets her, her magic name, Marilyn Monroe. And then when I started writing the novel, I completely fell in love with the realism of the times, with the politics, with the popular culture with the movies that Norma Jean saw 
And with the world of Los Angeles of disenfranchised people who are poor, poor people scrambling, and the mother who was in, in, the, in the insane asylum, and the girl in the foster home, and then she was in the orphanage. She was in the Los Angeles County Orphanage. She was the only orphan who couldn't be adopted because she actually had a mother, and her mother wouldn't give her up. Her mother couldn't take care of her and was not a good mother and never would hold her. Her mother didn't, feel, didn't really want to hold Norma Jean. But she wouldn't give her up to be adopted. So it was like a nightmare fairy tale where this one pretty little girl was the one orphan that nobody could ever adopt. She would never have a normal family. So I got writing that and got so excited and so immersed in it. I completely fell in love with the whole subject. And then I got so excited with seeing Marilyn, Marilyn Monroe's movies when she started to be an actress. I saw all her movies that are available, and I saw them in chronological order. So I could see this young actress changing and evolving and getting much, much more interesting. And right from the very beginnings, Don't Bother to Knock, which was her first real movie with Richard Woodmark, and then The Misfits when she's older and she's like 35 years old. Her eyes are all bloodshot, her hair is all bleached and, and sort of getting thin. Her life is ending. I mean, kind of seeing all that, it was to me, it became an American tragedy. So I didn't write the postmodernist novel I thought I would write, but a more of a, like a saga. And as I said, as soon as you started mentioning that, I just got goosebumps. I would so love to be able to do something like that again. But that's like, that's like the Muhammad Ali with his three great fights with, which, with, um, with Fraser. He, you can't do those sorts of things too often, you know. I felt that when I did Blonde, I would never ever write another long novel again. And my friend Russell Banks was writing his great long novel, Cloud Splitter. We were writing them together. And no, Russell had to stop. He said, I can't keep it up. I'm going to quit for a year. And he took time out. He couldn't keep on writing it. And he wrote his, um, he wrote a little novel in, in between, which is the novel, first person novel. Some of you maybe remember the title. I sort of blanked out on it now about the boy. It's, it's like a, a Huckleberry Finn kind of novel. I've sort of forgotten the title. But then I kept on with my novel, and then Russell went back and finished his, and I finished mine. But we both agreed we never read another long novel. Can I ask, what are you reading now? Oh, what am I reading now? Yeah. Well, I'm always reading something, and I read a lot for review. I'm reviewing something for the New Yorker right now. Um, I don't know. These things are not especially secret, I guess. I'm reading Margaret Drabble's first collection of short stories that's ever been published. Mm -hmm. So I'm sort of thinking about Margaret Drabble, and I was trying to work Margaret Drabble into thoughts about the ethics in a novel because she's so much concerned with ethics and with sort of a, a strong political and moral position in the novel. Another question on the side, yeah. Um, I have sort of a personal philosophical question. I'm not sure how interested you are in going back towards this area, so feel free not to answer. Um, and I'm, I'm asking because I, I have so much respect for the mind that I perceive in your writing. Um, this, it's kind of been a reoccurring theme with me. It's come up here today and in several of my classes about the notion of free will um, being a facade, or, or at least to an extent a facade, because of social menus that are given to you and, like you said, accidental things. So um, I'm wondering, with that idea, like, what is your personal reaction? How do you feel about that? Or what do you do with that? Or um, does that affect your choice-making process, knowing that? And um, just another thought that I had was, I think if you're making art or you're doing something that you're enthusiastic about, then the notion of free will becomes less urgent or important or in figuring that out um, because you're enjoying your experience. So you're just doing your thing. So that's what I'm curious about. Well, questions of free will and determinism are really impossible to answer because it's almost just a definition. You, know, you can say we don't have free will really much because we have to eat dinner, we have to sleep. We don't have an autonomy as physical beings. There's certain things that we always 
we all have to do in common, and we have to use the English language. Most of us in, in the room, you know, we're using vocabulary that's given to us, so we don't have a lot of freedom. But on the other hand, I think there are these happy accidents. And if I were a different person, I would think about adventures of travel, of going to some place I'd never been. And when you get to the place where you're going, there will be a story or an adventure waiting for you. I have a little section in my book called, uh, it's the, the uh, Faith of the Writer. There's a little section about inspiration. And the surrealists believed in inspiration of a very unconscious nature that you walk along the street. Of course, they were in Paris. Maybe that makes a difference. <laughs> you walk along the street, say you're a photographer like Man Ray. You're just walking along the street and you will definitely find something. Man Ray is going to find something to photograph, but you don't know what it will be. You may wander in the streets of Cairo or Benares or New York City with your camera for five hours, you're definitely going to find something. You know, it has nothing to do with free will, but you're making a choice to go into that. Then also with being a novelist, I feel that you must never begin writing your novel until you get so restless and excited that you have to begin. That there's a whole early stage where you're thinking. Like I spent a long time thinking about Marilyn Monroe and seeing that picture of her which I had on my wall and I can see it so vividly. And then I had other pictures I assembled. The Norma Jean Baker when she was 17, so innocent and, and sweet. Then pictures of her when she was an actress and how at that point her hair was bleach blonde then she had, had to have a little cosmetic surgery. And then she starts getting more and more stylized. The mole moves around on her face. You know, they're, they're engineering the look of her face and her hair and her, her makeup and her, her clothing. She's sort of tied into these, these very, very tight evening gowns, like in, in uh, Genoma Preferred Blondes, and all these images of Monroe to the one that Andy Warhol takes and vulgarizes in a horrific way. And I had them all together. Like, how do you get from Norma Jean Baker, who is a sweet, innocent girl, to this horrifically vulgar, sort of mass-produced Andy Warhol image of the same person? It's not that many years had gone by, actually. It's only about seven years had gone by. And then pictures of her in the Misfits. I've even seen a picture of her at kind of an angle in the county morgue. When she died, she was so poor. She was very famous, but she didn't have enough money in the bank that would in ensure a good funeral. So her body was in the, in the Los Angeles County morgue. It was just in sort of a, like a, in a closet room, and people were walking around looking at her. This is this great, famous actress that Playboy said it was the sex symbol of the 20th century. And I thought, this is incredibly ironic, you know. The great sex symbol of the 20th century is just in this morgue. But who came forward to save her from that fate? Joe DiMaggio, the very man she'd only been married to for about eight months. So all these, all these stories sort of come, I think, not exactly haphazardly, but one thing leads to another. And I've always felt that if you're in writing nonfiction rather, rather than fiction, it's like you grab a rope and you just keep getting pulled. Like you go out somewhere the Jasper, Wyoming, and you interview someone. Remember the Laramie Project? I don't know where they went. It was somewhere in Wyoming, I think. They went out, well, Laramie, obviously, Laramie, Wyoming. They went out to interview people after this young gay man had been murdered so horribly. And they wrote a play about it. And all the interviews are just sort of, you know, what happened? I mean, they were real and they were selected, but back in New York City or wherever the playwright was, they had no idea what, the, what they were going to encounter. So all these sort of fly in the face, I think, of being determined, that you do have a much more free will because accidents intervene. Can I? Just address that question a little because it's a question that has mattered a lot to me in my life and even more when I was at your age, I was obsessed with it. And I think that was because I was nurtured and nurtured myself on 19th century novels 
and the, the heart of the 19th century novel, as Vikram implied, is the notion of the character, the self-creating character who exerts some kind of thing, if not free will, then choice over her or his life. And, and it wasn't until later that I encountered writers like Chaucer, who vastly predates the 19th century novel and who doesn't care anything about these narratives of conclusion and learning. And you know, I, I was sort of thrown off by other kinds of literature that didn't follow this pattern. But it seems to me still that it's quite important to think that we do make choices. And we can see in the world that some people have more choices than others. In other words, there may not be such a thing as absolute free will, but there's relative free will compared to what other people have. And certainly, at other times of your life, you might have had less free will or more. You, you don't shape the whole course of your life, but you, you get to a point in it. And it's very important in Henry James, who's a very important novelist to me, these issue of choices and making the right choices or the wrong choices, and why do you make them. And it's very moving in Henry James when characters make the wrong choices. But then Henry James himself said in one of his latest novels, one of his last novels, The, the Ambassadors, he has a character say to another character, well, and if you have not had your life, what have you had? So at the end, there's an accumulation that's something that belongs to you. And it seems to me that this, this vision in, of the novel, that we have a choice and that we in some way shape our lives is like a wish, just like dreams are wish fulfillment. And that doesn't mean they're false. It means it's the ultimate end of a process that we may be on the way to and we'll never get to, like compass directions. We never get to north or south, or east, or west, but we use them to go places. And I think this novelistic notion of the character that shapes her life and has free will is useful to us in that way. And it, it's a great question. Yes, we do have another question back. Yeah. Uh, <clears throat> forgive me if you, someone's already answered this or asked this. Um, do you have a recommended uh, reading list and uh, in other words, what do you, like Oprah, of course, uh, comes to mind. But uh, in other words, what would a Renaissance woman read, you know, um, as compared to a Renaissance man? You might have a required reading list for Renaissance men. So anyway, you can respond to it as you like. Well, this could be for the whole panel. I, it recommended for what? You know, like, <laughs> what are you going to do with the reading list? Well, I, th I find it so exciting, and I don't find it at all depressing or disturbing to think of the accidents in reading and how for Melville to, to just start reading Hawthorne that one day allowed him then to write Moby Dick. He wouldn't have written Moby Dick, uh, this, this great work, and that Richard Ford happened to read Walker Percy, at, or w William Faulkner happened to read Joseph Conrad in Flaubert. You know, he might, William Faulkner might have just been reading Southern novelists of, about the you know, pre-Civil War and that sort of thing. It would have been a very different William Faulkner, but he was reading Joseph Conrad, and he was reading Flaubert and some other people, and Henry James, and that all went into, like, this, this confluence all went into the making of William Faulkner and made him this, this great writer. So basically, the recommended reading, I think, is just anything that that anybody else has said is a classic, first of all. And the reading is voluminous and infinite. You can read forever. We could read ancient Indian uh, literature. We could spend the rest of our lives learning the language and then reading it. We could read Chaucer and the medieval writers, and a lot of women now, uh, women medieval writers, were not available when I was a student. So basically, I think there's no answer to that question. If you want to write a certain kind of vernacular American literature, if you're trying to get published right today, then you would read a certain very select kind of, of writing. You know, it probably would not be a good idea to read Henry James. <laughs> or, or even our great Faulkner, you know. That kind of writing is not going to get published. The sort of writing that gets published fast and easily and accessibly today is first-person narration that's memoirist, either a memoir or something that's like a memoir, or chick lit, or something that's that's easy reading. If you're going to try to write the great American novel the way William Gass tried to write it, he wrote something called The Tunnel. He's in a lineage that goes back to Joyce's Finnegan's Wake, and that was a very revered lineage through the 1950s, maybe to the 1960s 
among people who were in, ac in the academic world, like John Barth and others. That line lineage, and maybe Wendy could respond to this, Odori, um, that lineage of the experimental writers of mid-century America, and Nebukov is, was an influential too, it's kind of died out. We have different lineage where Ray, uh, Raymond Carver would be more important, or Ann Beatty, or Joan Diddy, or someone. It's a different kind of writing that's descended, a little bit descended from Hemingway and Mark Twain. It's much easier. It's an easier kind of vernacular today. And if you're writing in this high style, some of my friends are, it's harder to get published. They may be very good writers. Then they do get published, but the books don't sell. Yeah, you know, I just would add to that, that that was one of the concerns driving my, my own uh, interest in novelistic aesthetics is um, <clears throat> how in the moment that we occupy right now, the traditional canons um, are queried. Uh, so we make these qualifications like uh, a Melville as high art, say, um, or James as high art, which a project that he was engaged in. So people, uh, contemporary readers who are hostile to James, and there are many, <laughs> of course there always were, but, but people would reverence him anyway and read him. Um, but, but the sense that there's something elitist about what James is doing and irrelevant to the, you know, contemporary reader or the, <clears throat> the modern reader, and they see that <clears throat> formal concern or extravagance as a kind of coldness, actually, and a hostility against his characters or uh, the uh, a negative effect in terms of uh, bringing them to life, you know, that Isabel Archer is just there to end up in that trap at the end. Uh, so I got, you know, extremely interested at this Cont uh, contemporary moment about the vectors of aesthetic evaluation for the novel. Seems like we went through a period at the beginning of the century with James and, and Wolf and Faulkner where there was a sense that, first of all, the novel could be great, <clears throat> and secondly, that it would be great in these certain formal ways <clears throat> as well as in terms of its uh, uh, wisdom that you would read it to learn something about free will or any other topic that, that might interest you or, or you felt that was uh, philosophical and necessary to living. Uh, but now, as we, um, because of the novel itself and the relativism of perspective that it encourages through its form, uh, we're at a point in our uh, evaluation of aesthetic creation where we feel nothing can be said except to say this is good for this kind of person, or this is uh, worthy of study for this particular reason. So the loss of the canon, I think, is uh, also what makes the project of saying what's a good novel a very interesting one today. I can add a, just a couple of remarks. The Cormac McCarthy is an example of a writer who's completely, he seems very unique and, and original, and he's very, very bizarre and wonderful. He's a wonderful writer, just radiantly insane, and I mean, just wonderful writer. But it's Hemingway and, and Faulkner coming together in him, and, and maybe the Bible, and all these voices that are very vatic and heraldic and transpersonal and, and lend themselves to comedy or satire. I mean, it'd be very easy to make fun of that, to parody what he's doing, but he doesn't seem to care. I mean, I remember reading Blood Meridian and thinking he's, he's making all these mistakes. He's doing all these things we tell our students never write this way. What's he doing, you know? Long, long sentences that don't even go anywhere and repetitions and, and crazy things and overwriting and bizarre, you know? And the whole idea of the Jamesian perspective where it's controlled from one point of view, which is like our own point of view, he just throws it out, you know? And, but it doesn't matter because he's his own person. He has so much uh, chutzpah, I guess is the word, is so much determined, he's determined to be this writer. It doesn't matter, he makes all these mistakes. It's like when Muhammad Ali started boxing as Cassius Clay, he held his gloves very low, he did all, he put his chin out. He did every, everything that the trainers tell the young boxers never do. And so when he appeared in the ring, people were, they were stunned, and some people hated him. They didn't want to look at him. He's doing everything wrong, but he did it wrong because that was his way, and because he was a new, a new kind of boxer, and what he was doing was absolutely like genius. So Cormac McCarthy is like that, and I think that's why McCarthy is admired by other writers, that he, he doesn't care if he makes a fool of himself. Norman Mailer was like that, too. He was willing to make a fool of himself. 
and it takes a real man or maybe a real woman, but it does, it's for a macho man like Norman to get out there and, and make a fool of himself, as Wendy is suggesting. It just allows for a kind of, it's like Cervantes, you know, he's gone to another level where he can be the fool and there's a foil and uh, he, he's not the person who has to be in control, which was Hemingway, who's always in control. The Hemingway figure did not want to be humiliated, but Norman sort of goes beyond that. I just wanted to address the idea of a reading list also and say, even though the canon is no longer there, and I myself am not a big fan of the canon in the sense that as a graduate student here in English, uh, there were writers I just couldn't read. I couldn't read Spencer, and so I didn't. I could barely read James Joyce after the Dubliners, and so I didn't. Um, and, you know, I mean, I, you, uh, you, it depends what you're going to do with your life. If you're going to teach those people, you have to read them. But if you're just a reader, if you're not a writer, throw the book aside if you, if you aren't enjoying it. I mean, by enjoy, I mean something very deep, learning from it, caring about it, et cetera. So a few books that you might not have heard of, but I think are very deep on that level and worth reading, other than Shakespeare and Cervantes, definitely read them. Don't miss them. Don't miss Dickens and all the ones that everybody's saying are great. But even Dickens you might not like, and so throw it aside. But here's a couple of suggestions. The Mayas by Itza de Quiros. It came out a year or two ago in a new translation by Margaret Jalcasta. It's a great 19th century Portuguese novel. Who knows anything about 19th century Portugal? M-A-I-A-S, The Mayas. It's a really great novel, a great novel with wonderful twists of perspective. Anthony Trollope's The Way We Live Now, an excellent perspective on the economic situation we're going through right now, although it was written 150 years ago. Um, Penelope Fitzgerald's The Beginning of Spring. Once you get onto Penelope Fitzgerald, you'll want to read everything of hers, and some are better than others. Uh, they're all short novels. They're all very strange. Some people like The Blue Flower best. That's set in 18th century Germany, but I love best the, the Beginning of Spring, which is set in Russia at the turn of the 19th to the 20th century with English-speaking characters who live in Russia. So that's just three to start with, and, and they come out every year. I was just saying before the lecture, Hilary Mantel, Wolf Hall or Beyond Black or A Place of Greater Safety, they're all great novels by Hilary Mantel. So there are a lot of writers that can move you hugely and change the way you think about writing, and they aren't talked about in the papers. We have time for perhaps one last question, if there is one. Yes, here. Thank you all so very much, and a question from Ms. Uh, Ms. Oates. Um, when and where and how do you find peace in the creative process? If peace is even something you're looking for, and if not, uh, what are you looking for? Thank you. How do I find peace in the creative process? Well, I think as a writer, I'm really a dramatist. I'm interested in dramatic confrontations that bring people of uh, disparate personalities together and create some new reality or some revelation. I mean, if I had to analyze myself, which I'm not really able to do that well, I would probably think of myself in these almost Shakespearean terms. Shakespearean in the sense that that's what Shakespeare did. Shakespeare, you could say to Shakespeare, what are your great themes, Will? Will? He says, <laughs> great themes? I'm trying to entertain an audience by bringing these disparate people together, putting Iago there and putting this fool Othello here and Desdemona, kind of getting them all together and shaking it up and then seeing what would happen. So I'm looking for almost the opposite of peace. I'm looking for some excitement and a revealing moments and scenes that take the characters to places that they didn't know that they were going and I didn't know as the author. And that basically is what I'm always looking and hoping for every time I start to write. I might start to write at, say, 8 in the morning or 7 in the morning or 3 in the afternoon and just hope that within a compass of a few hours I'll be in this other different place. And it might be very exciting. It might be filled with a sort of anxiety or apprehension but it will be different and new. So I want to thank Joyce Carol Oates, as well as the three panelists, Wendy Lesser, Vikram Chandra, and Dori Hale, and thank you for your questions. Thank you.